Dear flight students and followers, welcome to our series called The Toughest Five. Our mission is to help you succeed by showcasing how to solve the most challenging eight bell questions. In each episode, Fabian and I will go over the five most difficult and frequently commented on questions from each subject in the HBLQ database. We understand how tough these exams can be and we want to support you in overcoming these challenges by breaking down each question using sketches, easy tools and highlighting nasty traps and incorrect answers to show you how well you can prepare for your theoretical ATPL exam and boost your confidence in doing so. We will use HBLQ, which is best known among flight students as it is designed to be the perfect addition to studying the theory. With one of the largest up-to-date question databases, detailed explanations and a thriving comment section for each question, ATBLQ is the tool to prepare you for your upcoming theory exam. So do yourself a favor, reduce your anxiety, get access using the link below, then study with us, pass your exam and take the next step towards becoming a pilot. questions will be from the EASA ATBL database subject airframe and system. So pay attention, we'll give you three seconds to pause the question on the screen to test your knowledge and your solving strategy before we start with the explanation. Fabian and I are here to create yeah buddy moments with you. You'll see that in a minute, so sit back and enjoy the ride, grab pen and paper and let's get started. <laughs> Okay, let's rule out the incorrect answers. So answer A doesn't make any sense because you don't just scan horizontally, even more you're scanning vertically. You're constantly going up and down from the outside to the inside onto the primary flight instruments only using your eyes. Correct, Joe. Eyes is a good point, meaning answers C and D are also incorrect since this is an eye reference indicator and not a head reference indicator. As the pilot flying, as long as you are manually flying, your focus is on the outside and the primary flight instruments, as Joe just stated a second ago. Meaning you don't have to move your head during the scan unless you would want to make changes to your autopilot or any other system. But that's the job of your pilot monitoring. Well said, Fabian. So answer B is correct. I actually made an entire video on that topic, so we advise you to watch it to get a better understanding of the I reference indicator. Link to the video is right here. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Okay, let's go through the answers step by step. Keep in mind, this is a which statement is correct question. So starting with answer A, which is incorrect because auto brake settings aim for constant and predefined deceleration rates. So using any additional means that provide deceleration will result in a decrease of brake pressure of the auto brake system, resulting in a lower brake temperature. Very well said, Fabian. Answer B is relatable to the Airbus A350 and Airbus A380, which have a feature called the brake to vacate system, which regulates the necessary brake pressure and therefore the deceleration rate so that the aircraft reaches a specific turnoff speed at a pre-selected intersection at which the pilots want to exit the runway. Now this feature exists, but the term most airplanes making answer B therefore incorrect. And answer D is a little tricky because when you are rolling out during your landing, you do disconnect the auto brake system by applying manual brakes. But as the answer states, during taxiing, you would have RTO set, but it doesn't disconnect as a certain parameter aren't given during taxi. Therefore, answer C is correct. The max or RTO setting applies maximum brake pressure and deceleration once the thrust levels are brought to idle when certain type related parameters are met. For example, certain ground speed limits during takeoff roll. The RTO brake pressure equals the same pressure as if you would apply full manual braking. Yeah, buddy. Okay, yeah, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, super tricky question, and in my opinion, too much to ask from an ATBL student, because you would need to have an Airbus A320 type rating to find the right answer. Now, answers A, B, and C will all have a similar outcome, which is causing an activation of the alpha floor protection as the maximum AOA is reached, causing the thrust setting to go into toga mode regardless of the thrust lever position. Let me explain. Answer A. Trimming changes the aerodynamic balance but does not increase the thrust or airspeed, and at the critical AOA, trimming nose up can increase the risk of a stall as the AOA is increased. Answer B. By engaging the autopilot in vertical speed mode without sufficient airspeed or thrust, and the other thrust disengaged can result in an insufficient climb rate or even a stall. The autopilot also requires adequate thrust to maintain commanded climb rates. Answer C. Pulling back on the side stick increases the pitch attitude and AOA. At the critical AOA, this action risks pushing the aircraft into a stall. So Fabian, talk us through answer D. Sure, Joe. Answer D is the most correct answer, as increasing the thrust is the only way to be able to climb again and does also pose the safest option when flying near the critical angle of attack and low to the ground. Here's why. As we are slow, our excess thrust, which is the thrust available minus the thrust required, is already low. In order to increase our excess thrust, we need to increase the thrust available by moving the thrust levels forward. This will put the aircraft into an energy state in which it can either accelerate, climb, or a combination of both. So the correct answer is D. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> By the way, Fab and I highly recommend when it comes to studying for your exams, get together with your flight school buddy and work on these questions as a team. It will make it so much easier. So use the link below and get ATBLQ today. Go! Remember, the critical engine of an airplane is the engine in case of a failure would most adversely affect the aircraft's performance and handling, typically due to asymmetric thrust and aerodynamic factors, resulting in a yaw moment which has to be counteracted by applying rudder and aileron inputs towards the remaining engine. So for example, with clockwise turning propellers, the left-hand engine is the critical engine and vice versa for counterclockwise turning propellers. But more about that in a second. But upon engine failure, the aircraft will yaw towards the critical or failed engine, which if not counteracted, will result in a turn and further in a spiraling dive. This needs to be counteracted by applying rudder and also banking towards the live engine. And now by this fact, we can rule out all answers that state skid away from the critical engine, since this will support us in counteracting the yaw moment. Now Fabian will show us via a sketch how the center of gravity impacts stress on the rudder. Since Joe has already touched upon the critical engine, the reason for the left engine being the critical engine in this example is because with a pitch-up attitude, which airplanes and crews normally have, the down-going propeller blade has a greater AOA than the upwards-going blade, resulting in a shift of the thrust vector towards the side of the downward-going blade. Now this means that for clockwise rotating propellers, the thrust vector sits on the right side of the propeller disc. So the most adverse yawing moment will therefore be produced if the left engine fails. The CG, however, is the imaginary point in the aircraft where all masses are combined and where all moments turn about. An aft CG compared to a forward CG will noticeably reduce the moment arm of the rudder, leading to a much higher force that has to be applied in order to achieve the same moment as a lower force with a larger moment arm to the forward CG will. I hope the sketch made it more clear. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Okay, picture time. So the question is stating that we're talking about the compressor stage. Now this already puts figure three out of the question because in a compressor, 
The first set of blades are rotors and then stators. And a turbine is the other way around. So figure three is showing a turbine. If you want us to make a video explaining why exactly they are arranged in that order, comment below. For now, just remember the sequence. Then figure two makes no sense either. The compressor is sucking the air inwards. Given the blade position and the turn direction, it's rather pushing the air out than pulling it in. So figure four also makes no sense. Yes, the air is sucked in by the rotor, but given the blade position, the air won't be redirected by the stator. So to sum it up, it can only be figure one, as the rotor is at the front, it's sucking the air in and the stator is further redirecting the air. I admit this explanation is very basically speaking. Joe and I could do an entire video just on this question. <laughs> We added a more detailed explanation in the comments if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of this question. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> we hope our problem solving methods were clear and our sketches and explanations were helpful. If you want us to tackle more of these challenging questions, use the link below to get your ATPLQ subscription and start practicing right away. Notify ATPLQ via email which question you'd like us to do a video on and they will forward your request to us. The team of ATPLQ is always there to help and answer your questions and the question you struggle the most with might be the next one we're gonna be answering in a video. And on that bombshell, here is your checklist for today. Subscribe to my channel, check. Activate the notification bell, check. Follow my Instagram account, check. And click the link below to start learning with HPLQ today, check. And don't forget, a good pilot is always learning and the best candidates come well prepared. Wishing you all the best, Fabian and Captain Joe. <laughs> One, two.